Welcome to Authored by Us, a podcast celebrating children's books about characters of color or of different cultural experiences and the authors who bring these diverse works to life. Each week, we invite you to join us as we turn the pages of these bookshelf gems and hear from their creators who understand that stories of diverse experience truly come to life when authored by us. Here's your host, Zenzi Hodge. Greetings and welcome back, listeners. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Authored by Us. The journey of this podcast began out of my desire to share children's books by diverse authors with an audience that's just as diverse. Over the past year, I've been introduced to many new authors and new books, but today's author is one with whom I am very familiar, or at least his, with his work. In 2016, my son was in the fourth grade and he was given a reading project which would last the entire school year. Each student had to select eight books of various genre, read the books, and make a presentation to the class based on their selection. We had been ordering books from Scholastic for some years, and after amassing a collection of books about the occasional animal character and themed interests like Minecraft, I was hoping to find something more that would pique my young reader's interest. And I did. I came across a name, Kwame, and I automatically jumped to two conclusions. I concluded first that this author was black and that he was male. It didn't matter what the book was, I bought it. That book, The Crossover, initially became one of my son's selections for his reading project. He created a life-size cover of the book and presented his review both creatively and enthusiastically. But the book represented much more. This was his introduction to an author who looked like him by both race and gender, but who also loved books. I enjoyed the crossover because it was a book of poetry fashioned into a novel. And to this day, Filthy McNasty as a character and poem is my absolute favorite. This episode's author is Kwame Alexander, and he is the Kwame I was introduced to five years ago and whose vast collection of written work fill my son's bookshelf. Kwame Alexander is a poet, educator, publisher, and New York Times bestselling author of 35 books, including Swing, Becoming Muhammad Ali, which is co-authored with James Patterson, Booked, which was long listed for the National Book Award, Rebound, which was shortlisted for the prestigious UK Carnegie Medal, the Caldecott Medal, and Newbery Honor Picture Winning Book, The Undefeated, illustrated by Kadir Nelson, and his Newbery Medal winning middle grade novel, The Crossover. Kwame is a regular contributor to NPR's Morning Edition and is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award, the Coretta Scott King Author Honor, three NAACP Image Award nominations, and the 2017 inaugural Pat Conroy Legacy Award. In 2018, he founded the publishing imprint Versify and opened the Barbara E. Alexander Memorial Library and Health Clinic in Ghana as a part of Leap for Ghana an international literacy program he co-founded. He is the writer and executive producer of the crossover TV series on Disney+, Plus, which I am so excited to see. Thank you for joining us, Kwame, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Zinzi. It's good to be here. <laughs> you know, when I said that we have all of your books, like we really, we really do. So anytime after we purchase the crossover, Anytime I saw your name or my son saw your name somewhere on a book, we purchased it. It didn't really matter what it was. So I, I'm so happy that we're able to have you here today to talk about your books, talk about your collection and everything that you've done. So thanks for being here with us. Well, I appreciate the support. It's always, you know, a good feeling when you know that the work that you're putting out into the world is is being received well and, and people are, are are reading your book. So I appreciate you spending your money on your son and hope you spend a lot more. Absolutely. If you keep bringing the books out, we're absolutely going to continue to buy them. So one of the things with the crossover, and I know that you have many, but I decided that I would start with the crossover because this is how I was introduced to you. And I have read books of poetry. I remember my Maya Angelou collected poetry books. And I remember Antazaki Shange's For Colored Girls. It was a collection of poetry based on a theme, but 
I had never encountered a chapter book or a novel that was set with poems all brought together to tell a story. And that's what the crossover was. So can you tell us a bit about your book and how you brought this book to life? Well, I had never written a novel in verse. I'd read tons of poetry throughout my life. My mother introduced me to poetry as a child. Um, but uh, a friend of mine who worked at a publishing company approached me in 2008 and said, you know, Kwame, I've read a lot of your poetry. You have a strong voice. You really should think about writing a, a book of poems for kids and not just a book of poems. It, it should, the poems should connect. They should be linked. Um, you should perhaps consider writing a novel in verse. And I had, I had no idea what that was. And, and she sent me a copy of Out of the Dust by Karen Hess, which is a novel um, that's told through poems. And it just blew me away. And that led me to reading another book called All the Broken Pieces by Ann Berg, which is another novel told through poems. And I was like, how do you tell a story, you know, two, 300 pages through poetry? But they did it. And then I, I just went on this journey of, of reading all these books, keeping the night watch, um, the, the way a door closes. Um, these were amazing stories that were told and they were so concise and they had rhythm and, and some rhyme. And, and of course, I had read a bunch of poetry, like I said, so I knew poetry. I was familiar with it. I loved it. I had written 10 books of poetry myself. So I thought, well, maybe I should try it. And, and, and I set out to write this story that was pitched to me um, by this friend. She said, your story should be about a boy who plays basketball. And I thought, well, that's pretty specific, but let me try it. I mean, I wasn't very good at basketball, but I loved it. My dad played basketball. I watched basketball. So that was sort of the beginnings of me trying to sort of put together this, this novel in verse. And it took me four or five years to do it. Um, I started, I wrote a book of 50 poems. They were somewhat linked, but they weren't really telling the story. And I ended up scratching it and went back to it and said, well, wait, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not writing a book of poems. Maybe I'm writing a novel that happens to be told through poetry. And so I went back and, and, and started over and, you know, 2013, it was done. And, uh, and after 22 rejections, it got sold, it got published. There's so much that you that you said in that. Um, cool. We're gonna we're gonna talk about persistence with the 22 rejections, but really pulling poetry together because. So I know that it's a like a middle schooler novel, but my son was he was nine at the time, and so we started reading it together because there were poems. Poems are a little shorter. It's sometimes easier, but it's a little easier to digest. And so it started with us reading them together. And I said, well, let's go with this book. And I just started reading the poems to him. And I think that Filthy McNasty became a favorite for me because it had such punch to it. It was not like any poem that I read. It wasn't just about rhyme, but it was about some about rhythm. And I think that's really what drew him into it. And that you had two characters that were that were young boys, um, but there's also something you talk about in terms of writing poetry and being consistent with that, um, and also persevering through periods of rejection. Because I think oftentimes people may consider that, well, I've written a book, and someone's going to pick it up. But what happens when they don't? And that's another piece of a story that that you can tell to a young person. Uh, as they're reading, how to continue to persevere because success does not always come on that first swing. What kept you going? What what kept you going with this story? Why was it important that for this story to come out? Well, you know, not to get too deep, but if you think about the history of Black people in America, you know, like Langston Hughes said, I've been scarred and battered. My hopes the wind and shattered. Snow has frizzed me, sun has baked me. I think between them, they didn't try to make me stop laughing, stop loving, stop living. Mm -hmm. but I don't care, I'm still here. I mean, we still here. How did we survive? How did we persevere? Was it the music? Was it God? Was it family? Was it, was it hope? 
Was it the audacity, the hope? Was it some sort of faith? You know, was it our history? I guess a lot, you know, it was a lot of things mm -hmm. that allowed us to sort of still maintain some sense of humanity. Look, if our ancestors can go through everything they went through, facing the, the brutality of, of the Middle Passage and chattel slavery, I mean, come on, I'm just writing a book. I mean, really, I could, I could probably persevere a little bit and face rejection and ultimately realize that, you know, that if our ancestors built the pyramids, then my dreams are but milestones. Like, I'm just, this, I just got to be persistent. I just got to keep putting in the work because, you know, I'm here as a result of some of someone's putting in a lot of work in the face of a mm -hmm. lot of adversity. So when you think about it like that, you know, how can you not persevere? But you got to know your history. I just happen to be raised in a household with two historians, with two, you know, parents who understood how important it was for me to know, you know, my history, where I came from, how I got here, you know. Um, so, so, so from a very early age, Zinzi, I had this belief that I am the greatest not because I am better than anyone, but because no one is better than me. And I've, I've walked through life, you know, feeling pretty confident about myself. And that was instilled in me from my parents from, a, from, from the day I was, I, I was born. So when I got to this stage of writing this novel and facing all these rejections, yeah, I was sad. I was, you know, I, was, I, I teared up because no one thought it was a good enough book. But I never stopped thinking it was a good book. Mm -hmm. So those two things happened, you know, sort of simultaneously. I was sad, but I never thought that what they were saying was true. I just wanted the book to be published. And so I think that if you have, if you sort of walk through life with that kind of confidence, you know, saying yes to yourself, even in the, even in the face of a bunch of no's, Eventually, the yes is going to is going to circle back to you, and uh, and that's what happened. That's my deep, that's my deep answer. <laughs> well, I wrote it down: saying yes to yourself in the face of a bunch of no's. I I'm, I'm going to repurpose that and and put it up as a quote for um for my son to see because it it is important. We're we're going to face some rejections. You're going to encounter some stumbling blocks, but it's to 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 keep going on. I I love that you talked about your your parents and your household. And there was one thing that I took for granted initially when we started reading the crossover um was that they this was set in a two-parent household. And um as I talk with other authors, we 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 celebrate the fact that there are two parent households that are that are being brought forward on the pages of their books. And so when we read the crossover, it the two parent household, it really reflected our household uh, that my son grew up in. And then you introduced something towards the end of the book that I did not imagine happening. You talked about hypertension, but I could not have imagined what was going to happen at the end. And it was also something that sadly became a reality for my son and I mm. when my husband died. Mm. Mm. And so as he and I were reading this book, his dad was there. And so we were talking about these two children having lost their father. And I had no idea that this was something that he was going to experience. And we, I leaned on the crossover and we talked about Josh and JB and what they experienced because it was it was so real, but why was it important for you to create character the, the types of characters that you did and introduce the real life experiences that they had in this book? Well, first of all, I'm I'm so sorry to hear that, Zinzi. Um, it's you know no one's ever prepared for loss. It's, it's a new normal. It's a new way to live and. Uh, when I was writing the crossover, I had no idea I was going to deal with hypertension. Um, I knew that it ran rampant through the black community. Mm -hmm. um, until my mother called and said, your father's had a heart attack. And I remember, you know, being in the hospital room with him and, and listening to him joke with the nurses, you know, and, and he made a recovery and, 
and later on he had another heart attack and and uh, he out, he 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 and he he's living today he outlived my mother um and you know to this day he demands royalties from this book because of his inspiration <laughs> Because that's what sort of tricks me to talk about it because I was dealing with so many emotions when he was in the hospital and he mm-hmm. had the second heart attack. And I was like, how does this happen? And it just led me to, and this was all while I was writing a draft of the crossover. And so we, you know, we bring a lot of what we're dealing with in our lives, mm-hmm. in our writing, we're trying to reconcile and heal. And so, so his experience, that experience that we shared, I was trying to, to understand that. And that that is what made me write about it. And then um, the other sort of general, more broader answer to your question is that I set out to write a book about two boys who grew up like I did, laughing, loving, living, dancing, having friends, crushes, jealousies, you know, just normal kids. And I think for so often we use this def- this deficit language and we have this sort of boxed in story when we think about black kids that they're marginal or somehow other or different. And I, 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 I've never believed that. And I try to write in a way that I support this notion that they are just like everyone else. They, they live lives and they have drama and they have love and they deal with stuff and they, get jealous and they play video games and they <laughs> don't do their homework and they and they and they know how to spell and they read the dictionary and just whatever mm-hmm. all the all the stuff that I saw with me and my friends that I think gets you know we don't we don't see that in in the media and in, in the literature we haven't so much and so so I try to write those normal lives because they're real <laughs> They they were very real. Um, yes, their their rivalry over the affections of Miss Sweet Tea, uh, and not because they both wanted her, but because you know, as siblings, we're we're competing. She's taking time away from from what we are supposed to be doing together, and th- those are normal. I-, I thought it was a normal thing for boys to be introduced to having affections for one boy to be having affections for a girl. I thought that was amazing. Um, my son liked Josh because of his hair. Mm. Uh, and he had locks and it was the part where you described that Josh described his, his locks as his wings. And so I know our hair can often be politicized and for our young men, it can be ostracized and criminalized. Uh, they can face that because of their hair, but I really appreciated that you gave Josh his wings. And so after my son read the book, he decided that he was going to grow his hair out and he was going to have his wings. So like I told you, right, this was back in 2016. He has been growing his hair since then. Does not necessarily have locks because at the time when he went to his dad, he said, hey, dad, I want to get locks. And my husband was like, absolutely not. You know, he he had a clean hair and he was like, absolutely not. You're not doing that. And so there's this nine year old trying to explain to his father about why he wanted locks. And I said, well, Raphael, you got to go and tell him why this is important to you. And he was like, dad, I want them because in this book, this boy has locks and these are his wings. And that meant so much to him. Mm. And so he was determined and he was truly inspired. So he has asked me to ask you a question. He had included a question. So he, he wanted to ask you, how does it feel to be an inspiration to others, particularly young men, uh, young readers, and young writers of color? Well, I appreciate the question so much. Um, I, I've been inspired by a lot of people in my life, from my, you know, my parents to my grandparents um, to, to other writers like Langston Hughes and Nikki Giovanni. And I've all I've grown up in this environment where the words matter, where the thing the things that are written 
the stories that are told, the songs that are sung, they matter. Like art is only, you know, as good as the inspiration that it offers to to humanity. And so I don't write just for entertainment. I write to entertain you and engage you and, and, and enlighten you and hopefully empower you. Like that's my goal. And, you know, when I was in college studying with Nikki Giovanni, she would often tell me, Kwame, your poems are too didactic. You're too didactic. <laughs> And, and, and it was because I, I, wanted, I had a message. I was trying to teach. I was always trying to teach through my poetry. So my goal, I finally figured out, you know, 20 years later, how to teach and still entertain. And I think when you have those two things, entertainment and teaching, entertainment and education, when you have a good balance of that, it, apparently that is what we call inspiration. And so it, it is my goal to try to inspire. And so it, that's my hope and that's my goal when I write. Um, so how does it feel? It feels like I'm doing my job. It feels like I'm, you know, I'm being accountable to my purpose. And I, it feels like I'm doing the work that I set out to do. Yeah. Um. Now, I know what's on the horizon for the crossover, but can you tell our listeners what's coming next for the crossover? Well, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. <laughs> I will say this. We, uh, we sold the crossover to Disney Plus, and we shot the pilot episode in New Orleans this summer, nice. beginning of the summer, and I've seen it. It's beautiful. And we are literally waiting for the call to say, okay, we're gonna green light the whole season. So we got one episode in the can and we're waiting for the call. So, you know, if I start screaming in the middle of this podcast, it means we got the call right now. <laughs> if I start crying, it means we got the call right now. So just waiting on the call, um, but that's what's next. Um, all all signs point to, you know, it's, I'm going to claim it, that it's going to happen, that we're yeah. going to get an order for the whole season. So. Well, I remember when you announced it on Facebook, I was, so I was screaming in my house when I saw it. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that, you know, you're not a basketball player and neither is my son. And I'm like, see, I told you, you needed to work on your basketball skills so you can audition. Right. Right. <laughs> so we, we are absolutely, um, praying along with you that this comes this comes to pass because it's an amazing book and I you ask the question who do your who do your uh, fans on Facebook think should be the dad I voted for Derek Luke just so you know I was one of the people oh, that cool. said that he would be perfect and so I can't wait to see this um, this air on Disney plus for other children to be able to enjoy and other parents to be able to enjoy because I absolutely love it Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. And and Derek is, Derek did such a good job. Yes. And he was so pivotal that it actually changed the arc of the series. Because I mean, you and I have talked about, and and I would imagine at the beginning of this episode, you're gonna have to say something like, "Spoiler alert! There are some spoilers in this episode." in case you haven't read the crossover. crossover. But I will say this, that there was some arcs, there was some, some things that were gonna happen in season one that aren't gonna happen now. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they are, I'm, I'm saying too much. We're, we're gonna pivot off of the crossover so we don't spoil anything else. Okay. I, so I'm gonna talk about two books of yours that we purchased last year. Um, and so I, I always have to like introduce something that goes along with the question. So my son had to complete an application for a program and they asked, you know, who are your favorite authors, right? Now he said his mom, which surprised me. I was like, oh my gosh, really? I said, I wrote a book. These people are authors, but he called two other names, James Patterson and Kwame Alexander. 
Wow. And I'm like, oh, wow. Because James Patterson and middle school divorce years of my life, he loves those series. And of course, you are, you know, you are his gateway to reading a reading these books. And so to see that you and James Patterson collaborated to write a book about someone that he absolutely adores, Muhammad Ali, when that, when we saw the pre-order, he's like, mom, we're getting that. And so we do have Becoming Muhammad Ali. But also last year, as we were in the midst of COVID and the midst of racial unrest, you brought forth Light for the World to See. Mm. Can you tell us about those two books? Um, well, Light for the World to See was sort of my way to get back into a space of writing and feeling like I mattered, like writing mattered, because I, there was a certain point during the lockdown you know, once the video of George Floyd surfaced where I just felt like writing wasn't going to do anything. I don't know what, if I'm not out on the front lines, you know, marching or rioting or something, I'm not fighting back in some physical way, then I'm not, I'm not really doing anything. I, I, the right, what's the, what's the point of writing? What, what is a poem going to do? A poem's not going to stop a bullet. And so I just began, I just, I couldn't write. And, and so that I started reading a lot. And I, I, I you know, I, I read a lot of, um, I, I came across a quote by Toni Morrison, where she talked about in times like these, we really need the writers and the artists to step up to and essentially, you know, and then to pivot to Langston Hughes to help us dream a new world, to help us remind ourselves that we matter, to give us, to give ourselves a voice and to stand up and to lift it. So, so, so I sort of, and so then I just sat down and started writing. And I wrote, I wrote this poem. Um, I wrote this poem and I, American bullet points. And it's the first poem in light for the world to see. And it helped me feel better. It helped me feel a little bit more saner. It helped me get back, you know, at the desk which was my battlefield and using the pen as my weapon. And so, so that, so that, that's, that, that, that poem helped me. It, it was cathartic. It was healing. It was a, it was a, it was a Psalm. Um, and so after writing that, my editor said, Kwame, you should really think about publishing that poem. And then of course that led to, well, let me think about what else I would put in this book and and so that book became this way of me um, sort of showcasing a light for other people yeah. to, see, to see where we've been, where we are, and where we should be headed. Yeah. And to be real and truthful about it all, you know, through, through poetry. Like you said, poetry allows us to digest things a lot, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. easier. So that's where that book came from. And then... The other book was Becoming Muhammad Ali. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, yes, yes. So, yeah, so James Patterson called me out the blue and asked me wow. to write, he asked me to write that book with him. Nice. And we had met a couple times. And so so we had a, a a relationship of sorts. And I initially I didn't jump at the opportunity. Um, I talked to some librarians, I talked to my dad. And eventually I, I saw the value in it and it, it took us about a year and uh, it was an amazing experience to write that book because Muhammad Ali was one of my heroes and idols from a child, from my childhood. And, and, and James Patterson had a connection with Ali's wife. They, they knew each other. Oh. They had gone to Vanderbilt. Um, 
they both gone to Vanderbilt University. And so mm -hmm. there was a connection there. And so we just decided we're going to do this. And, and, and during the process, he would write one chapter, I'd write another. He'd write one chapter, I'd write another. We'd go back and forth round robin. And there was one point, Zinzi, where I, there was something he wrote that I had some, some notes on, some edits. So I sent him an email that said, you should really consider changing this. And my dad said, do you realize you just told the world's best-selling author that you tried to edit him? You can't do that. <laughs> and, and I remember I got an email back and it said, dear Kwame, I would never begin to tell you how to write your poetry. Love Jim or something like that. <laughs> well, thank so you. Put me in my place, like, no, right? And then... Uh, <laughs> He ended up making the change. He ended wow. up you know, making the change. So I have a, I like that guy a lot. He's 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 a heck of a, a heck of a guy, heck of a writer. So your son thinking that the three of us are, are his favorite writers, I think that's amazing. Well, you know, I, I only got credit because hey, I'm mom, you know. I, I provide food and shelter. Come on, but you guys, that is amazing. So Kwame, when I said we have your books. We have your books, okay? We've got, we've got the novels in verse. We even have the right thing, which teaches a writing workshop for 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 young writers. You got that so, book? That's old school. I sure do. Well, my mom is a retired English professor, and my dad was a teacher who also enjoyed writing poetry. So writing is a thing that we did. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, it's another one of his books. Let's get that. How can I encourage my kid to to, to engage in writing? But unfortunately, as children get older, reading and writing become academic requirements rather than recreational enjoyments. Right. So how do you think we nurture a love for reading and writing that transcends parents reading to their children when they're young and high schools having to write a paper for a grade? How do we, how do we get them beyond that? Poetry. As they introduce them to poetry, it's short, it's concise, it's rhythmic. <laughs> It's a lot of white space. They can accomplish something. They build, it builds confidence. It triggers voice. Introduce kids to poetry. This is what works for me. This is what worked on me. I think it's, it's something that we can use. That's why I think novels and verse are great bridges for kids. If you think about it, we introduce our children to, to, to literature in terms of picture books and chapter books. And then something happens around middle school and they, get, they become you know, uh, disinterested in it. And, yeah. and, and, and then we expect them to get to high school and want to read, you know, the Odyssey and Beowulf yeah. and Shakespeare. And <laughs> I feel like there needs to be a bridge. And I think poetry can be the bridge to getting our kids to appreciate language and literature in a life-giving and life-saving way. So that's, that's my feeling. It's, it's the poetry. I agree with you. And when you said Beowulf, I just had a flashback to high school. And it was not a good flashback at all. <laughs> Exactly. Now, your work as an author is not just confined to your pages. Uh, you've made literacy a mission um, that you share with others around the world. And you created the Barbara E. Alexander Memorial Library and Health Clinic in Ghana as a part of that mission. Can you tell us about the inspiration behind the project and also why you chose Ghana? Well, a friend of mine became the queen mother of a village in Ghana. This was in 2012, and she asked me to come with her and, and participate in the ceremony. It's called a Durbar ceremony. Where she would be given her stool, which is, you know, in Ghana, if you're a king or a royal um, um, person, you would be given a stool, like a golden stool. Well, not necessarily a golden stool, but a stool. It's a symbol of that royalness, royalty. And so I went to Ghana with her, first time in Africa. And I remember driving from the airport in a taxi for two hours and getting to this village and it was pouring rain. And the village was, it was in a rural part of Ghana in the Eastern region, it was called Kanko. And there were no roads, it was just, you know, it was just dirt and craters and rocks. And I remember getting to this village and it's just muddy and I had on these white pants because I was trying to look fly. 
these white linen pants. I remember getting out of the taxi and my pants are just all brown now because they're just full of mud. And I had on sandals too, trying because it was hot. So my feet are all. I remember some guys coming over and taking off my sandals and cleaning them for me and cleaning off my bottom of my legs and my pants. And I mean, I remember the ceremony starting and and it being pretty powerful. And I remember coming back the next day to the village to speak to the kids, 200 kids in a school. And I, I envisioned it was going to be a school and it was a dirt floor with no roof and no ceiling. And it's just an open space, essentially. And I, it, my first children's book, Acoustic Rooster and His Barnyard Band, had been published a year earlier. And I remember reading that book to the kids. It's about a rooster that stars a jazz band with Duck Ellington and Niels Davis. And I remember reading the book to the kids. And while I was reading it, a rooster walked up beside me. I thought it was wow. the funniest thing. <laughs> and I remember wanting them to give me another, give me a book from the library to read because the kids were enjoying me reading to them. And the teacher saying they didn't have any books. And I think that was the moment where I said, I'm going to bring more books into this, this community. And I spent the next five years trying to do that with friends, coming back once and twice a year, bringing more books. And uh, we had about 5,000 books when it was all said and done. And, and then we decided we were going to build a library. And we raised money and we did it. And it opened in the summer of 2018. I named it after my mother, who was my first librarian, as it were, um, who had passed a year earlier. Wow. <clears throat> and what it meant for those children that you read to them and you shared a book th with them and have introduced more books to their lives um, and thinking what they will do with that experience and how they will impact their children and a next generation beyond that. Um, I have one final question for you. Um, and it's a question I ask everyone that, that joins us. What was the book that had the most impact on you when you were growing up? Uh, probably the greatest. Uh, my story, the autobiography of Muhammad Ali. And it was the first real book that I, A, chose to read by myself without any adult saying you got to read it. B, it was the first book that was over a couple hundred pages that I read, it was 430 some pages. Um, and see, it was the first book I read in one sitting, I couldn't put it down. Wow. So it really had an in, uh, a impact on me, you know, as an 11 year old, that books can sort of rip your heart, heart out and stomp on it. It can tear you apart and put you back together. It can entertain you and enlighten you and empower you and ultimately inspire you to be the greatest, which is what that book did. So how interesting that, you know, 40 years later, 30 some years later, it would all come full circle and I ended up writing a book about Muhammad Ali. So that, that was the book. That's the book that started it all to get us here today. Yeah. Wow. Kwame, I, I want to tell you, thank you so much for, for spending this time with us for this, for this conversation. Um, when I reached out to you, it was on the request of my kid. And that just said, Hey mom, you should send him a message on Facebook. And I did not know where it would end up. Um, and I am so happy that it ended up here. Thank you for being here with us today on this episode, for sharing your story and giving, sharing your voice with our reader, with our listeners. I truly, truly appreciate having talked to you today. Oh, I'm so honored to be on Authored by Us. And let me just say, everybody out there, you want to find out the latest, the greatest on authors of color, you need to tune in to Authored by Us with Zinzi Hodge every day or every week. Or every time you just need to be enlightened, because this is the podcast, and I'm Kwame Alexander, and I'm out of here. As we close the cover on this bookshelf, Jim, I would love to thank today's author, Kwame Alexander, for joining us for this episode of Authored by Us. I would also like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, for being here with us this week. 
and tuning in every week as we introduce a new author sharing their book. Until next time, happy reading. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Authored by Us. Every author has a story to tell, and we enjoy bringing their stories to you each week. Whether you are listening as a young reader or are sharing this podcast with the young readers in your life, we are delighted to celebrate these stories inspired by diversity and shared in the voice of their authors. Follow us on social media at Authored by Us and subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcast app. That way you never miss an episode. Have a gem on your bookshelf that we should have on ours? Visit us online at authoredbyus.com and let us know. Until next time, happy reading.